You're listening to 10 Points, a podcast with your hosts, Ash and Nicholas, where all the talk is Canadian Highlander, our favorite format from the best trading card game ever, Magic the Gathering. Hi guys, it's me, Ash. And me, Nicholas. And today we're going to do a deep dive into my favorite deck, Blue Eye Control. But first, we want to bring you our best card from the set Legends. Ash, what's your best card? So there were a few options for this set, but I went with what I... I think it's just the card that I've cast from this set more than anything else, which is going to be Sylvan Library. My guess is this is a pretty would be a pretty standard pick from this set because there's not too much in this set that actually sees play, but uh, Library has got to be the most ubiquitous. I considered Library. I was, I was torn between three cards. Um, I ultimately landed on Krakus, it's just a free roll in, I mean, first of all, in any white deck, but like most two color decks, there's just so many like legendary creatures that your opponents play and that you play that bouncing to your hand is just really good. Like being able to bounce your own Vincer or whatever, or just like keep one of their legendary creatures from ever mattering. Yeah. Um, Seth actually Torok Caracas to me. Yeah, that'll do it. It was bad. <laughs> all right. Do we want to go ahead and get into our deep dive yeah let's let's do that so the first thing i really want to talk about when it comes to blue eye control um we're going to be talking all about the deck but the first thing i want to talk about is how this deck is it plays a lot different than a lot of other decks in the highlander and maybe magic as a whole because this deck uh its game plan is going to be super different matchup to matchup yeah where a lot of other decks are a lot more linear. This one is going to be really dependent on what you're playing against. Yeah, this you cannot play this deck the same way against every deck because you'll just lose. Um, it You have to keep hands and make plays based on the knowledge you have of your opponent's deck. So uh, I guess the good way to kind of explain that is the basic example is how you would play it against a control deck versus how you would play it against, say... The deck we talked about a couple episodes ago, uh, Red Green Bond. Like if Nicholas was on control, you know, we'd be spending a lot of time staring at each other, waiting for someone to flinch, right? But if I'm playing against Chad on his deck, Chad's going to be playing a very proactive game plan trying to kill me, and I'm going to have to play the best way to actually deal with those threats. Yeah, exactly. Like more grindy matchups or... Uh, more about maintaining card advantage and um, just answering your opponent's threat while creating your own. The like more aggro matchups um, are definitely much more about very quickly trying to find a way to stabilize uh, because control decks do suffer in like the earlier turns of the game. So you definitely have to find a hand that you can remove some of their early threats and then be able to kind of stabilize later to ultimately win so i also want to talk a little bit about how blue eye control is different than other control decks yeah i definitely think it's important to talk about why play blue eye um other over like other control decks i think that's one thing about uh control is that the like build of the deck is definitely very dependent on like your meta so blue white is really good at beating certain metas while other variants might be better at beating others yeah and actually a prime example of that that's really relevant right now is that uh, blue white control is really really good at beating mid-range and like aggro decks like that's where it shines um it's actually honestly pretty good at beating other control decks yeah, Blue White uh, really preys on the fair decks, I think. I think where it struggles a little bit more is like various combo decks, especially like Storm type decks, um, because your only real interaction with uh, things besides creatures um, is like counter spells, and you're not super great at dealing with like non creature permanents. So things like artifacts in like Paradox decks are very strong and then also storm you just can't really interact with their hand so they can just set up a hand where they can silence you so i think that's where like maybe like a demir control or even uh like a grixis control or esper or something like that playing black for some hand attack um or maybe some red for some artifact removal um depending on the meta 
Yeah, I was actually just at dinner with one of my D&D players, and I was explaining to him how the exactly that, how a Demir or maybe probably Grixis would be the best against this kind of deck, primarily because Grixis usually has more threats than most control decks, so it can actually present a threat faster and will interact with the hand a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Grixis, you get the uh, flexibility of being able to throw your burn spells at their face if, if need be. Yeah, and I will say um, the other thing that makes Blue White Control different from another type of control deck, though this is really obvious, is the way that Control is different, or Blue White Control is different than like prison style control decks, is those decks aren't usually playing counter spells or even necessarily blue, where Blue White Control very obviously is. Yeah, Blue White Control is definitely like a lot different than those decks. It's like in like the cards that you play, you want to play like a lot of ways to churn through your deck. Uh, and find your answers so a lot of that comes in the form of various cantrips like you play obviously brainstorm ponder preordain um, but sometimes you even like are on uh, like peak and stuff like that uh, because you don't have that hand attack the extra information is very strong i guess uh, we should also say even though it might be implied we've got a deck list uh, we've actually got hopefully by the time this comes out we will have gotten two deck lists for this uh this this description here one is my current build very very slightly different than my current build um, i changed it very slightly and the other is going to be a build with a different point spread which we'll talk about a little bit later yeah like I, as we've talked about in some previous episodes ash is a huge fan of blue eye control he uh plays a lot of it so uh the list we'll be using are his because he has uh Quite a few more reps on the deck than I do. Indeed. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, Nick was alluding to there for a minute. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the different card types we play in this deck. They kind of fall into a couple big categories. So, some of the most obvious ones are going to be counter spells or counter magic, whatever you want to call it. Cantrips, which are going to be the kind of spells that are going to draw you one card. Sometimes they will be able to filter cards like ponder, preordain. Um, serum visions and other times they just do something else and draw a card like thought scour mental note or peak but those are the kinds that are only going to be drawing one card they're going to give you some sort of benefit while helping you sift through your deck for what you're actually looking for um, the other type of card advantage card is going to be just card engines or cards that are going to draw you two cards uh, such as like m most of the planeswalkers in this deck fall under the card advantage category like narset parter avails to fairy time raveler those are all going to be doing they're going to be drawing you cards and doing other stuff or destroying you two cards. Uh, obviously, like, Jace the Mind Sculptor is really good at that. But we've also got, like, Chemistry's Insight, or Memory Deluge, Mystic Confluence, things that are going to just straight up draw multiple cards. Yeah. And then and even another form of card advantage um, are just things like Wraths, or um, other types of, like, two-for-ones that just give you card advantage by really just depleting more of your opponent's resources than you spent to... Uh, get rid of them mm -hmm. the other uh, couple other types of cards we have are going to be one for one removal which kind of counter spells sort of fall into the same category you, you're just kind of removing spells rather than removing creatures um, but you've got your 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 bread and butter your source of plowshares path to exile condemn is very good uh, but you've also got some other uh, slightly more obscure ones uh, Faithful Absence isn't really obscure it's just new but Faithful Absence Council's Judgment and a recent inclusion which is not on this current list is Prismatic Ending and some fetchable lands of off colors to make that work a little better uh, as well as Detention Sphere that stuff is going to be removing not just creatures but um, one of your biggest issues as Blue Eye Control is dealing with Planeswalkers so those are all ways to remove those as well yeah, and as we were talking about earlier, uh, yeah, Bloy Control has tons of ways to deal with creatures, but things like problematic artifacts or enchantments can prove to be a little more difficult. So things like Council's Judgment and like Prismatic Ending, like he was talking about, are really important to have those answers if you need them. Yeah, and then the last main kind of uh, card type that is really relevant in this deck is Wind Conditions. Now, m most, if not all, of these win conditions, actually, realistically, all of these win conditions have a an additional uh, effect to them. 
So they they actually help keep you in the game before they actually end up winning the game for you. The uh, the only one that maybe wouldn't fall into that category all that well is God Eternal Capnet, but he still blocks, and honestly, he's on the chopping block anyway, so don't look at him too closely. I mean, and he gets you card advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with yeah with blue eye control, you really your goal isn't really to win it's to get to a position where you won't lose and then your cards like will eventually kill them so like even like cards that seem like their main goal is to win the game like elspeth sun's champion uh elspeth is really good at just stabilizing uh by Mm -hmm. making blockers to just block their creatures until you can get to a position where you can wrath the board and then just counter any relevant things and then you just start attacking until they're dead Yep, I'm also Elspeth's really good at just ticking up, making blockers, and then minusing and killing them all at once. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, the basic card types that you're going to see in this deck. Um, If I missed anything, I suppose that it would be Humility is a bit of a weird one, but it's basically like a card advantage card, because you just turn all your opponent's creatures into like 2, 3, and 4 mana 1 ones. Yeah, I think of Humility as like a Wrath that just like sits there all all game uh as someone that frequently plays four color kiki pod humility is just like unbeatable it's it hurts me every time cards fire okay uh so nick you want to talk a little bit about threat assessment just to give yeah. an intro on it before we go deeper into it later yeah i would say threat assessment is probably the most important uh aspect of playing blue white control um and threat assessment is basically just assessing if something needs to be dealt with now or if you can deal with it later um so like if you have a counter spell in hand and your opponent just plays a creature um it sometimes may be right to save that counter spell if you think that you can survive long enough or if you think that they have uh, something better in their hand that needs uh, to be dealt with. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about threat assessment as we talk about how to play some different matchups. But uh, I guess, Nick, I'll throw this to you. Do you want to talk about some good matchups or some bad matchups or some like neutral matchups? Uh, I figure we should like talk about how to play like one of each. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can just give an example of each and then kind of how you want to play through it. Starting out with good matchups, we kind of alluded to this earlier, blue-white control really preys on creature decks. Um, so a good example would be, like Ash said earlier, um, Chad's deck, the red-green bond deck that we talked about earlier. Just because blue-white is so good at just dealing with those creatures and then keeping new creatures from coming down, um, it has like plenty of wraths, uh, one-for-ones, counter spells. So what you are really looking for in those matchups are like ways to deal with the early threats and then just ways to like stay alive after that early game. Because those decks, if they can get out faster than you can deal with them, they can still win. But if you have like a swords or something to deal with their like turn one, turn two uh, kind of threats, you can usually by like turn three, turn four, get in a pretty good position after maybe a wrath and some some cantrips to dig for more interaction yeah that's exactly right um sometimes uh if you're on the draw in those matchups you can't or sorry if you're on the play in those matchups you can actually it depends on how quickly they're playing out a threat and what kind of threat it is but you can sometimes avoid spending your one for one removal and just save for a wrath because they know usually they know they have to present multiple threats otherwise they're just putting themselves too far behind one good thing to do against blue light control is try to save back some of your threats so that after they wrath you can play more out so having that one for one removal left in hand is really nice for dealing with the threat that they play after you wrath yeah one very common play pattern on blue white and this is actually pretty much agnostic of the matchup but you're usually going to spend at turns one and two digging for more lands just assuring you hit your land drops if you have a hand with like a couple lands you might not need to do that but often you are spending the first little bit digging for lands just to set up the your mid and late game because that's your deck is not an early game deck, but it is very much a mid and late game deck. So uh, you're usually setting up land drops the first couple turns. So if you can avoid having to take one of those turns off to 
cast removal, that's great for you. So uh, if you know if you already have a wrath, you already even have you know some of the lands you need. You can just spend like one turn digging for lands and then be able to wrath on forward. That's really what you want to be doing. But uh, oftentimes, if they they get a really fast start, especially like against medium red or other mana crypt decks. Or even Soul Ring decks, you can you can definitely find yourself looking down the barrel of a Rabble Master on your uh, when you play your first your first land, right? Um, and in cases like that, you do pretty much have to spend your removal immediately. Otherwise, you're starting you're basically starting at ten life, and well, that that usually isn't going to work. Yeah, I think that is a good like uh, an important thing to bring up too. In Blue White Control, even more so than other decks, your life total is really a resource where you're looking at you're really like focusing on the clock that they're presenting and making sure to always be gauging how many turns do you have how can i hold this removal and wait to wrath or do i need to deal with this now because i have been like been killed by so many blue light control players that survive at one life um just because they are able to utilize that one life so well because one's not zero and once they stabilize it's really hard to uh to force anything through yeah, and uh, knowing how the clock is going to progress is actually a super, super important thing when playing blue-white control against aggro decks. For, for the sake of this discussion, regardless of what Chad says, I'm counting his deck as an aggro deck here. Uh, when you're playing blue-white control against an aggro deck, you knowing how fast our clock is currently and how fast it can get is extremely important. So sometimes people kind of look, like when they see peak in my list, they look at a weird, like, that's an interesting inclusion, but... Um, since I put it in for the first time, it has never, ever come out of my list because it is so imp- – that, that information is extremely important. It's not just like the eighth cantrip. The the information is extremely important in this kind of deck. Yeah, even not just for like figuring out what the clock is, but if you have a counterspell in hand, it is really nice to know – what they have in hand because if they play some powerful three drop but you know that they have an even better four drop coming that you have to be able to deal with it's really nice to know to hold that counter spell even if usually you would spend it on their three mana play yeah very very true um also if you have an option on which piece of removal to use it can be very like um like you know sometimes I've been looking at my hand and I have a swords to play. Well, I, let's say I have a path to exile and I have a prismatic ending, which is reasonably common. Being able to peek at their hand before I remove their creature in play, so I can be like, okay, so I didn't want to give them a land. I wanted to use the prismatic ending, but I just looked in their hand and they have a planeswalker that I have no other way to remove, and I need to remove it. Luckily, I have the prismatic ending I can cast for three next turn, so I'm going to use the path to exile now. Just knowing how to use what answers you have, because it's pretty short on some types of answers. So uh, knowing what answers you need to save for what they have, not what they could have, or what they do have, is extremely important. Exactly. Okay, Um, kind of the last thing I really want to bring up about this uh, matchup is often... Th- these are the kind of matchups you don't really scoop early um, because uh, you, and by that I mean you pretty much don't concede till you are actually dead because oftentimes you're just top decking a terminus away yep so uh, yeah, uh, oftentimes they don't have much else from than what's on the board so even when you're getting pretty low and you're dead next turn it, you can very much draw a wrath and turn the whole game around I guess while I lie, I have two. I guess I have two more things to say about this matchup. Is you also really want to pay attention to how you're using your land removal lands, um, wasteland, tectonic edge. Tectonic edge is not the best one. I just have a really pretty foil, so I'm playing it, but it's very viable. <laughs> uh, anyway, wasteland, tectonic edge, and uh, field of ruin. You really want to be cognizant that you're not just using those to hit random. Like, you know, just trying to jack up their lands, you almost never do that. You're always saving it for man lands or Field of the Dead, pretty much. There's almost nothing else you use them on in these matchups. And Field of the Dead is not in the aggro decks, so you're almost always using it on man lands. Um, so that's a little tidbit for you. Okay, uh, do you have anything else to say about that matchup? Uh, no, do you want to go ahead and talk about a more neutral matchup? Yeah, um... I think this one's this one might be obvious to a number of our listeners, but one of the fairest matchups in the entire, like this entire format, uh, and especially our metagame, is uh, blue white control versus uh, black green rock. 
part of the reason this matchup is so fair is because or so even is we're both playing a lot of fair cards and we're both playing a lot of removal and not as many threats uh, if i had to say what deck is probably more favored in this matchup i would probably say the rock is slightly more favored but not by much um, it really comes down to draws and skill, I think, in this matchup. The biggest thing uh, from the controls perspective, at least in, in our metagame, the player who is playing the rock, uh, specifically against his build, which is a very, very Planeswalker heavy build. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up too, is yeah. it definitely really depends on the build of the rock, because Blue White has a lot of ways to interact with creatures, uh, and not quite as many to interact with Planeswalkers. So if it's all, if a very ha planeswalker heavy build of the rock, you just both have a bunch of dead creature removal spells. So you're really hoping to hit your uh, other pieces of interaction or threats. Yeah. The uh, anyway, what I would say is the number one thing you have to be looking for in this matchup is if you can get it, a a sustainable source of card advantage. Um, my current list is not playing search for Ascanta, but that would be an amazing option in this matchup. But um. If you can keep a Jace Fringe Prodigy in play long enough to flip it, that's great. Uh, if you can land like a Narset Parter Avails, that is very good. If you can land a Teferi Hero of Dominaria, that's even better. Um, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Yeah, that one's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but those are going to be the things you're going to be looking for. Um, you're going to try your absolute hardest to not spend a single piece of removal that could kill a Planeswalker. You do not want to spend it on a creature. If you can avoid it, you can't do that. Because uh, this deck has too many Planeswalkers, and almost every single one of them is a must-answer threat. So you need to save your removal for them. Um, that includes your Prismatic Ending for uh, their 3 and 4 drops. Now, uh, my current build is playing a Raugrun Triumph and a Watery Grave, as far as uh, off-color uh, uh, lands. But something notable is the Rock deck is almost always going to be playing a Yavimaya. And we'll be looking to get it in play because they have a lot of stuff that is... They have a lot of things, a lot of utility lands, especially sets build. So you have to be... Uh, so they, they kind of have to play it to make their deck work. So you can sometimes get your fifth color off of that to take out a five drop. Or maybe just more easy to take out a four drop with Prismatic Ending. But the main other thing you're going to look for is you're going to try... You're probably going to be countering their hand attack because... You do have a decent number of dead cards in this in this matchup, which, uh, which is mostly... Well, it's not dead as much as it's not nearly as good, which is most of your creatures are not that good because he he's going to have a lot of removal. Um, but the other thing is a lot of your creature removal isn't quite as good because his creatures aren't as important as his Planeswalkers. So um, he'll leave you with... If they get hand attack, they're going to take your Planeswalker removal or your draw engines, and that's kind of your way into the game. So really, it's uh, this is a little less cut and dry compared to the aggro matchup. It is a lot more about specifically what's going on in individual games. But broadly speaking, uh, you're going to care about Planeswalkers and Planeswalker removal. Yeah, and definitely, like you said, and really in any of these grindy matchups, like uh, you've like especially against like other control decks, what you're really looking for is a way to just generate more card advantage because uh, it's going to come down to who runs out of answers first and then who can get their threat to win the game. So I, in like really grindy metas, really love the card like Force of Portal just because it just keeps drawing you cards until you've outvalued them. Yeah. I guess one thing I forgot about also is you typically want to, if your opponent's attacking you with some creatures that they're going to do damage, but they're likely not going to end the game. You And you have removal. I will often uh, not cast, the, if it's instant speed, I will often not cast it, and I will just hold up a counter spell uh, in case they were to play a Planeswalker in their second main. And then if they don't, then I will accept the damage I already took and, like, swords their creature on their end step. But uh, I would rather not save myself some damage, but then lose to the Planeswalker they got to land because I tapped down. Yeah, and that's where that like threat assessment and clock um, and keeping track of the clock really comes in. Yeah, is knowing can I take this hit um, to possibly gain more value. I guess some also something that I've seen some uh, control players play like a way that I've seen newer control players play in the past is they'll oft they have counter spell their opponent casts a spell they counter it don't even read the card. Broadly speaking. Control is really all about, it's not all about stopping what everything your opponent's doing. 
it's deciding what you care about your opponent doing and how to use what you know like when to counter something versus when to wait to wrath it and all that good stuff okay i think that's about everything oh uh, one more thing for the rock matchup uh, if it's a lands variant of the rock they're going to be playing field of the dead and you need to save a piece of land removal for that field of the dead unfortunately not a lot of exile ways to exile lands in this deck actually i'm not sure i have any so usually it's hope they don't get a field of the dead online too early yeah uh i got let's move on to a bad matchup one very bad matchup uh i think we kind of brought this up earlier is storm um specifically yeah like dedicated like underworld breach storm decks or something like that um and while it might seem like blue white would be favored in this matchup the uh the problem is storm is both very fast like storm is very fast but if you give it enough time it can just sit there and continue to set up and continue to set up until um you present a threat and blue white isn't particularly great at presenting threats so what storm can do is just um like keep setting up until it has the win and like a silence or like hand attack or something like that so that uh blue white can't do anything yeah, I would uh I, I I would say that I also was guilty of thinking blue white, oh, it must have a good matchup against Storm. And then I kinda of looked at a list and talked to Nicholas about it and then played the matchup and was like, Oh, this is unwinnable. There is it is not if it is not literally unwinnable, but it is very tough. In order to win you need a really good hand that consists of a couple things, including counter spells and um one of pretty much one of two specific threats um in my current build uh there are different threat options in other builds of course but basically you just have to get a fast threat which your deck is not very good at in my list the three options that will actually end the game fast enough are myth realized if you have enough of a cantrip you draw monastery mentor and gideon in the trials are also relatively fast ways to win and depending on the storm list gideon might actually keep you alive though the standard breed storm list Gideon does not actually work because they can just kill it too. Yeah, usually if breed storm is going off, there's not much you can do. Um, and yeah, like he said, you really, you really want those counter spells. The problem with blue light control is that you have so many wraths and uh, like one for one removal spells that just are dead cards in the matchup. So you really need. You really need a hand that's got a lot of relevant cards for that matchup because just so many cards in your deck are dead. Yep, very much so. And the thing about blue white control is it actually doesn't play very much filtering. It, it plays a very small amount. It's like brainstorm, and your other brainstorm like effects and fetch lands. That's that's about it. Yeah. So if you draw those bad cards, you, you you're kind of stuck with them. Yeah, there's like some versions where you play. I can't even remember the name of the card. The one that shuffles the card back in and then draws you to... Yeah, Latinum's Legacy. You're probably not playing that unless you're on like a, a very specific build, which we'll we'll get to in a little bit. Well, actually, that, that's not exactly true. It's not exactly true. It's actually a, a pretty standard... Well, uh, it, for me, it was a it was a pretty standard include. Um, I cut it relatively recently as the meta got... The, the creature meta got faster. It seemed that the best thing to do is actually to be able to just deal with the threats faster. And it seemed like I just needed more wraths instead of more cantrips to find wraths. So uh, that one was the one that bit the bullet for that. But as the meta has actually been slowly shifting to be a little more grindy, that is actually a very, very good option. That it, it's it's probably like in, in the 105 right now, honestly. Yeah, and we'll get to how to build for different meta games later. Yeah, so I'd say the best way to play the storm matchup is really look for those hands that you can put down a clock. And well, like a lot of the time they'll say don't counter the tutor, counter the tutor, tutor target. That may not go for um, the storm matchup as much because you really want to keep them from getting um, like a silence or something. Because if you can uh counter like a, a good spell at a right time on the turn that they're going off um you can set them really far back but you have to actually be able to counter that spell mm -hmm. and uh after that um anything else do you want to talk about matchup wise uh no i think i'm good 
Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about point spreads. Uh, first, we'll talk about the point spread in my current list, and then the uh, actually, I kind of not it's not written down in our little breakdown here, but I want to talk about my current list point spread, the alternative to my current list point spread, and then alternatives to like non recall versions because my current version is playing an ancestral recall. Yeah. But uh, you can, I played this deck for a long time without it. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of, like, small changes that you can make to this deck's point spread. I mean, not so much on the recall version, you're kind of uh, locked into, like, two or three different point spreads, but with the uh, non-recall point spread, you're just playing a lot of, like, one-point and two-pointed cards, so there's a lot of uh, flexibility in what you do with that. Yeah, and we'll get that in a little more detail in just a minute. But um, for the points that I'm currently running, it is uh, seven points for Ancestral Recall, two points for Spellseeker, and one point for Dig Through Time. Now, the alternative to this one that's still playing the Recall, uh, at least the alternative that I consider to be viable, is um, you basically just swap out Spellseeker for Mystical Tutor. Um I some people say to do uh, merchant scroll, which gets recall, of course. But I just the fact that it, I can't use a merchant scroll to go grab a removal spell just makes it not worth it to me. Yeah, merchant so I don't, scroll. I don't ever play it. Yeah, it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it either, but there's nothing wrong with playing it. Um, the other thing, if you are on the uh, mystical tutor point spread, um, you can. Uh, you're already on Terminus, but you can add and treat the angels, um, and that's a really good way to just kind of win out of nowhere, which is something that the deck doesn't usually do. But mm -hmm. if you're on the mystical tutor point spread, and treat the angels is probably um, a good option. And I would only suggest and treat the angels in a slightly grindier meta game because if you are playing it in an aggro meta, um, drawing it is like drawing a blank piece of cardboard because in a grindier meta, if you draw it early, you can usually at least brainstorm it back. But in a more aggro meta, it's often just a blank piece of cardboard, which gets you nowhere. Um, but uh, as for the uh, the the more, the, uh, we'll say the the not power point spread, because obviously it's a recall is not accessible to everybody. Um, uh, you get to play what we've talked about this probably several times now. I'm not even sure. But we, we kind of call it the small blue point spread, um, where you're just playing a bunch of small pointed blue cards, such as Stick Through Time, Treasure Cruise, Mana Drain, Spellseeker, Merchant Scroll, well, maybe not Merchant Scroll, uh, Mystical Tutor, True Name Nemesis. I have played all of those cards, including Merchant Scroll, in blue-white control at one point or another. Um, and Soul Ring. My, my personal favorite spread when it's not recall is uh, I play Soul Ring, Spellseeker, Merchant Scroll, Dig Through Time, and Treasure Cruise. Soaring just kind of jets you into the Planeswalkers and Wraths. But, uh... I think that was nine points. I think you also throw a True Name in there. I would do Drain over True Name. You would? I feel like I would... Hold on, so four points, two points, two points, one point, one point. No, that's, that's ten. Wait, where's... Soaring's four... M mystical tutors two merchant or sorry uh mystical tutors two. Oh wait never mind sorry you're right yeah um yeah so you can also get a uh get, I, I would do probably would do a um mana drain but true name is a completely viable option you're not attacking with it most of the time though <laughs> yeah uh they say true name is the best wall yeah um, wall of omens pretty good. fire though yeah, Wall of Omens is very good. Um, uh, one thing, uh, kind of going back to the recall point spread, but also the uh, the other alternate point spreads, one important thing to consider with Spellseeker that just made it a lot better than it was previously um, is the printing of Dam, where Spellseeker can now go get a Wrath. Um, you're actually just playing Dam as a Wrath of God. You're not ever casting it as a single target removal spell, but you can uh, tutor it with Spellseeker, which is huge in that deck. Um, two little points of order on that. Uh, first, you would play Dam even without Spellseeker because you want 
four mana wraths and that's just wrath of god is one of the best ones and damn is wrath of god too and uh also um you if it, it i haven't had it come up but it very very reasonably can because urborg is a very common card uh you can just cast it through an urborg if you yeah, single mean, target something you're definitely not including it in your deck for that reason though no um, not at all but it, but it is relevant yeah. Yeah, it is very good uh, in that deck. And additionally, another thing that made uh, Spellseeker even better as a point option, and probably that in alignment with Dam is probably the reason I'm playing it right now, is that uh, it can now get not one but two different ways to remove Planeswalkers. It could get uh, Prismatic Ending, if that will remove the Planeswalker in question, assuming it depends how you've been fetching. And it gets Fateful Absence, which also can, of course, remove a Planeswalker. So those are two very pertinent reasons to be playing Spellseeker as well. Yeah. Another point spread option um, that we didn't mention is Balance. Um, balance is a little bit more of a build-around um, yeah. include, but uh, in certain lists it can be very strong. Yeah, I um I used to be really high on it. It was a great option to get is the wrath you can give a spell seeker. Now there's a better wrath to give a spell seeker and you don't have to discard half your hand and leave them with a the creature still. Um so I've put in pretty far off uh, balance for a little while now, but it is if you build around it a little bit it it can be very powerful. Um I I've I've I would not suggest it, but I have played an Armageddon version of Blue White. <laughs> yeah. Um it's yeah, it's definitely it's not, not quite the I don't I wouldn't say it's the optimal list, but it's like it can still be really strong. Um, especially in the right metas. Um another points option is Library of Alexandria. Um Yeah. That is obviously a very strong card and Blue White is really good at maintaining those seven cards. So uh Library of Alexandria can utilize. I mean, Blue White can utilize lab, Library of Alexandria very well. Yeah, especially in the early, uh, early, early. If you get it early game. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, uh, I want to talk briefly about how to build your deck, like how you're going to change the deck for different meta games. So, uh, Nick, you want to talk a bit about the changes you would make to the deck in a very. We talked about this a bit already, but if you how you would change the deck for a very like very green mid rangey kind of kind of metagame yeah so i mean really it like comes down to numbers um like you're maybe playing one or two more wraths or one or two less wraths than normal uh maybe you go down uh like if you're in like a really creature heavy kind of green meta maybe you go down a few counter spells um for some more removal spells um and kind of um like make your threats like things like Elspeth Sun's Champion are really strong in those metas. Um, like Wall of Omens is one that um, in like creature metas is very strong, but in uh, more grindy metas isn't uh, always the best. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the other main thing you would change in more grindy metas is uh, I would probably actually include Oblivion Ring just as another option to kill Planeswalkers. Um, understanding with Oblivion Ring and Detention Sphere, they can remove those and get their permanent back. But uh, you could always do the good old, if you make it to seven mana, you could Oblivion Ring and bounce it with the trigger on the stack. Always a good one. Yeah. Um, but uh, also in more grindy metas, uh, there are a couple other Planeswalkers you could uh, slot in. Kind of keep up with all the other people playing so many Planeswalkers. Um, you could play the four mana Teferi Master of Time. It's not amazing, but in that kind of metagame, it can go a long way. Um, another good option is... I, I, I've only played it with it a little bit. I know you like this card a lot. It's the the five mana Jace from Shadows of Ernestrad. Yeah, I don't know how high I am on that card anymore. When I uh, first got into Highlander, that was an auto-include in all of my... Uh, control decks um but we had a very uh grindy control heavy meta so i think it's strong in those metas and that's another thing um in grindy metas you want a lot of those uh repeatable card advantage sources um yeah so yeah that jace is really good course of portal is really good um 
even just uh like some of the uh bigger more expensive instant speed draw spells that you wouldn't play normally you can afford to play yeah. in those grindy metas um so if you are holding up something on their turn and they don't end up uh playing anything you can in step cast your uh I'm trying to think what's the five mana draw three Mr. Confluence? Oh, or like Inspir- or uh, Jace's Intuition. Yeah, J- yeah, Jace's Intuition is something you're definitely not playing in um, just like in a blind meta, but if you know that you're going up against a lot of uh, grindy decks, a lot of blue decks, um, mm-hmm. I think it's definitely a viable option. Yeah. Two other car- things, or two other things I would say, maybe three, I guess. If it's a really gr- a blue grindy meta game, um, considering dispel as an option and generally in more grindy metas i will go back to playing coercive portal my current list is not it's a very slow thing yeah also that search deal with creatures when it hits play. yeah search res canto would be an include uh, very very com- comfortably and uh coercive portal and i'd probably uh, actually cut creatures even the ones that are like you know you could consider them as like the utility creatures like i would very possibly be cutting um I would likely cut God Eternal Kefnet, and I'd probably consider cutting the the Jace French Prodigy because in those kind of meta games, it often gets removed immediately. Yeah, in those meta games, I really like to shift my threats into more Planeswalkers. Um, yeah, and really cut down low on the creatures. Um, like in in your current list, I see like Timeless Dragon is still a good option, um, just because it's like recurrable, but also uh, the plane cycling adds that extra flexibility if you are in one of those grindy matchups because while you may be in a grindy meta that doesn't mean every matchup will be up against one of those grindy decks so you do still need uh ways to beat the not blue grindy decks which i think is an important thing to talk about when you're uh, talking about how to build for different meta games is don't um don't get over over trigger happy with uh building for a very specific part of the meta and then you play against the uh the few people that are not on uh what you're expecting and you just get completely destroyed because you were so focused on building for a specific type of deck yeah um, i do want to make a quick note about timeless dragon which goes into the last thing i was going to say about uh, building for a grindy meta is I- even in the current meta um i think i've gone one game that involved the timeless dragon that i did not plain cycle it um you cycle it almost every time uh, and that goes into what i was saying earlier about how you spend the early turn setting up land drops and uh this you, you this is a thing that you spend early to get guarantee your land drops and then later bring back as a blocker or a threat um you're almost never getting two creatures out of it you're almost always getting the land and a creature out of it and that's how you want to think about it in this deck um and that brings me to the other thing i was going to say which is then in the more grindy metas i would also consider going up one maybe even two lands because uh in those game like in, in, the, in the in the more aggro games you can get away with missing a land drop or two like if you're missing land drop number five or seven like whatever but in these much more grindy games you that can really be the difference uh between a win and a loss really you just want to be staying uh, ahead of your opponent and resources in those grindy matchups uh, or in those grindy metas in the more like aggro aggressive metas um, you don't need to be staying behind staying ahead as much as keeping them from getting too far ahead until you can get into the later portion of the game mm-hmm. uh, but yeah in those grindy metas you definitely want to be trying to stay ahead yeah, um, so for, I, I kind of already forgot, did we talk about how to build for an aggro meta already? Uh, not really. Okay, we definitely talked a lot about the aggro matchups, and honestly, this current list is built for the aggro matchup. Um, my current list actually has one more wrath in it. It's, uh, I don't remember what it's called. It's the one that, it's from the cons block that destroys creatures and everything attached to them. Editor's note, the card name was End Hostilities. But... Basically, you play very much like this build. You play a lot of Wraths. You play a lot of creatures that can do a thing and also block or trade. Um, and you play every piece of spot removal that's that's viable, yeah. basically. Again, this list should have a prismatic ending in it. 
Yeah. If you're in like a really aggressive meta with like a lot of red, you can maybe play some life gain. Uh, I've seen some blue white lists that are playing like um, Archangel of Thune, um, and even some that are on Kitchen Finks. Um, but that's yeah, Kitchen really, Finks is great. Yeah, that's really only for like the really aggressive like red metas. Mm-hmm. Um, additionally, in the creature metas, Humility is a great option. That's why I'm on it now. Um, but if it's a very red creature meta, I would highly suggest cutting some of your land, your non-basic lands, and playing more basics, and making more conscious effort to play toward basic lands, because often they're going to be playing Blood Moons and uh, Prize of Progresses. Yeah, and Blight Control is really good at um, surviving off of those basics. While it's definitely nice to have the non-basics, you definitely don't need them all. And you can definitely uh, shift into a more basic heavy list. Um, sometimes some builds will even uh, go really far into the basics and play back to basics, depending on the meta. If you have a lot of uh, green mana bases in your meta, you can get them with back to basics. Very true. Okay, and then um, we kind of already talked about uh, the control meta. What I want to talk slightly more about, about is the combo meta. And really, the only the only thing that really changes about that is you're not you're not really gonna build control to be storm very well unless you're adding more threats. But uh, if you were to attempt to do so, your best bet is gonna be playing really really cheap counter spells, which is often gonna be like spell pierces. Um, probably not fluster storm. I I'm really not very high on that card, but some people like it. If you're in a lot of storm style combo decks, then it might be correct, but I've never lived in a com or in a meta game like that. But you'll want to play like spell pierces, probably dispels, and mental missteps, that kind of stuff. They're really, really cheap counter spells. Yeah, you can even be playing um, things like Vendillion Cleek and Aven Mind Sensor. Um, those are both mm-hmm, really good. Um, even uh, Nimble Obstructionist uh, having the flexibility a i mean first of all it's a good threat and like i said you really want to be able to get a clock down against those combo decks but also that stifle can be really relevant um against pretty much any combo deck yeah um any combo decks you're if you're in a combo you will be playing like playing all regular stifle um and there's also it's also a pretty good idea to include cards like shadow of doubt uh, i think you, you already said even mind sensor right yes yeah, just to just to interrupt their ability to search the library, as uh, tutoring is how most combo decks function, and uh, two of those, of course, also are helping provide threats. So you're playing more threats. The other big thing, I guess, would be to, uh, depending on the combo deck, if getting into the trials keeps you alive, you might mulligan to it. But for blue white control specifically, combo is the hardest to build for. But luckily, it's rarely that a combo is the meta in Highlander. Yeah, we did have like a big Thassa's Oracle meta um, last year. That's true. Uh, and that's the kind of meta where blue-white control might not be the best. Um, and that's even, uh, I know we're talking about blue-white control, but that might even be the time where you maybe consider uh, shifting into some Esper or uh, even just cutting the white and going into like Demir or Grixis or something. Yeah. Uh, and that's the good thing about just control decks in general is you can build them a lot of different ways to where it plays very similarly, but can beat uh, different decks. Yeah, I will say Thassa's Oracle is also an awkward example because Thassa's Oracle was dominant against everything. Like, it was either you were playing Thassa's Oracle or you were losing to Thassa's Oracle, and sometimes you were doing both. Yeah, no, uh, Thassa's Oracle was one of my least favorite cards when it first came out. Yeah, the last thing about uh, non-creature combo decks is you'll play less removal over less creature removal overall because those are almost always completely dead. Yeah, uh you definitely want your removal to be more flexible in those other metas or non creature combo heavy metas. Okay. So um we're almost out of time here, but we got two more things to do. We're gonna talk about we have we, we did receive two questions from from the Discord. So let me let me get that for you for us. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from CJ Man. I think you know who that is. There's two questions. The first one is, what is Blue Eye Control's weakness? And then w- the second is, what are some niche cards you don't see played enough in the deck? Uh, so we talked a little bit about the deck's weaknesses already. The biggest are decks that uh, get a lot of value by not being pressured. 
um, primarily Storm was the big one, but there are uh, some other combo decks and other control decks that um, yeah, uh, have more threats that can be a little bit of a problem if you don't provide a threat. But um, the other thing that Blue Eye actually struggles with is if you get off to a really, really fast start, like Medium Red is known to do, sometimes Red Green Bond is known to do, it is it can be uh, really tough to turn the corner, as it were, and actually stabilize from that. Uh, especially against fast red decks. Yeah, RDW is probably one of uh, Blue White's worst matchups, just because um, it just like is try- it's just trying to go so fast. It's kind of funny that even though RDW probably is one of Blue White's worst matchups, uh, Medium Red is actually a better matchup. Um, mainly because though they do often go fast, they don't necessarily always go fast enough uh, to dodge like the Swords and Paths type cards. And then they have less. They they have less actual threats sometimes. So then I can beat that. The important distinction between those two decks is one of them is more about threat quality quickly, and then the other one is about threat quantity quickly. Um. So while with medium red, yeah. if you can deal with their fast threats, they'll run out of like those quality threats pretty quickly because a lot of their uh, cards are being spent trying to get those quality creatures out. Uh, or quality threats out fast, where with RDW, just every single card in their deck is trying to kill you, so you have to be able to answer everything. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Um. so I would say anything that gets benefits from uh, being unpressured is a pretty big problem for your deck. Um. And then, uh, really, anything that's not playing a lot of creatures in the current metagame is going to be a problem, because I'm going to draw a lot of dead cards. Yeah. Um. Now, uh, as for niche cards, I'm sorry, did, did you want to answer that question? Anything else you have to say about that? Not about the first question, no. Okay. As for niche cards that I don't see played uh, all that much, um, just to name a few, uh, I think Timeless Dragon is insanely good in this deck, um, and I don't see it in lists all the time. Uh, people don't. People just don't think about Dam, even though it's just Wrath of God. Yeah. Um, the downside is I did once get my damn spell pe- uh, spell snared. It really sucked. Um, and then uh, there were a couple other ones. Peak, we already talked about. A lot of people don't play it. They don't understand why it's there, uh, but it's extremely good. And uh, the, probably the biggest one that people don't play that I started playing was Myth Realized. Um, yeah. This is basically your lowest investment win condition in your entire deck. It is extremely good. Um, it's pretty tough to remove a lot of the time. Um, it's got a little easier with prisma- the, the presence of prismatic ending, but still broadly speaking, against a lot of decks, if you just don't activate it till it gets out of bolt range, they can't kill it for the rest of the game. And um, the biggest deal about Mithrealized is in this metagame, the deck is a lot of the time playing to humility. And Mithrealized, uh, it actually works through humility, to how layers work. So so does uh, Gideon. That also works through humility. So does Celestial Colonnade. That works through humility. It is relevant that that also works for your opponent as well. So if they have uh, man lands or something like that, you have to be careful. That is true. Um, Smuggler's Copter as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Myth Realize is probably the biggest one. Um, I don't... Yeah, think... a few more. There's uh, Ondo Inversion, which is... Um, not great in every meta, but in some more uh, like Planeswalker heavy or grindier metas, um, that's one that doesn't immediately pop into the pop to your mind, but that's really good. Mm-hmm. And th- this one, ninety percent of the not probably ninety five percent of the time I'm playing it as a land, but uh, like when you need that uh, plan of cleansing, you need that plan of cleansing. And then like a really niche card that uh, definitely doesn't go in every list, but um, in certain lists, Enlightened Tutor uh, can actually be worth playing. Yeah. Um, if you're on, like, Detention Sphere, Humility, um, and, like, Back to Basics, it's uh, just, like, a good kind of niche card that can... Uh, it's pretty flexible. Um, when we had a metagame that was actually extremely red, I actually played both Enlightened Tutor and Story Circle. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know what Story Circle is, it's an enchantment, ETB, name and color. And uh, you can activate, you can pay a white to prevent damage from the target 
a target permanent that has that color for this turn, and it's uh, it's it was good. It was it, it was all right. All right. Did you say we got another question? Uh, th- those were the two questions. Oh, okay. So, uh, we're really running out of time, so let's talk quickly about what we played this week in our record. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I was actually on Storm. Um, I went two and one. Uh, my first matchup. All right. Well, I got it. Okay. So actually, so I defied odds this week. Uh, there were three decks in our um in our like tournament that I did not want to play against. I played against all three of them. Uh, the first one was uh, Blue Moon, which is one of those control decks that is, first of all, really good at putting down pressure, but also pretty good at disrupting your opponent. And I was, uh, I managed to win that matchup. And then I played against Death and Taxes, which, uh, as you can guess, is a really bad matchup for Storm. And I managed to win that one. And then I went up against Ash. Uh, on sp- i'm gonna spoil what he was on he was on medium red and i uh lost game one quite rapidly and then could have won game two but i had been up since 4 a.m that morning due to work and i like completely misplayed uh and should have had one more red mana than i did um and so i managed to lose game two as well uh, but I was pretty happy with going two and one, considering that those were the three decks that I did not want to play against. Yes, uh, you 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 ended the night at the top table. So, um, I don't recall what I played on Tuesday. I think it was probably blue eye control, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, on Thursday, I played medium red, uh, and I I I don't own a ragavan. I I may have borrowed a ragavan. Um, and then I drew that Ragavan several times and did not lose the game in which I had a Ragavan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that Ragavan is what killed me both games that I played against him. Ragavan carried me so hard. Um, Ragavan's broken, you guys. Rag- r- honestly, Ragavan to six. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I won round one. I was playing against four color lands, and uh, I just drew, honestly, two of the fastest hands I've ever seen. On turn one, one game, I had... Uh, I had a land, a mana crypt, a Lelia, and a Ragavan in play, and a Chromox on turn one. And then, that was game two, actually. But, uh, the first game was over very, very quickly as well with similar cards. Actually, both Lelia and a Ragavan again. Um, but, uh, some other stuff too. But it was just a very, very, very fast game, or match one. Uh, match two i went up against <sighs> who did i go up against match two i think it was oh it was i was up against seth actually on green black rock um game one was pretty quick no actually no game one was actually a little bit slow um ended up getting there because i got up to a really fast start game two uh i mulligan to five put up a pretty good fight ended up losing then game three was over in a in a heartbeat. Uh, I got there really fast, uh, as the deck tends to do. And then game uh, match three, Nicholas already described. I won game one pretty quick, and then uh, well, pretty quick with an idol on. I think was the main thing. And then game two, um, he misplayed and he didn't. Uh, I, my clock didn't allow for one more turn on him. Yeah, I had also just spent so many resources. Uh, basically, what happened. Uh, was I had a Dark Ritual, a, uh, what's the red one mana ritual that makes two red? Rite of Flame? Yeah, I had a Dark Ritual, a Rite of Flame, and a, um, yeah, my brain's not working. The two mana one, two mana black ritual that has a uh, spell master or whatever. Cabal Ritual? Yeah, so I had those. That's um, Threshold. Yeah, Threshold. Um. And I sequenced wrong so that I cast the uh, the red ritual first and then had to use the mana off of that. Well, I, I yeah, I misplayed. I should I could have had two red mana left over to uh, use uh, gamble off of my underworld breach, but I was short one red mana. Um, and so I tried very hard, but I couldn't quite uh, 
get a line to victory without that gamble. All right. Well, uh, anything else you want to say? No, I'm good. All right. Well, that'll uh, wrap up our deep dive on Blue White Control. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to, I don't know, do we, do I, do we drop our Twitters in here? You can tweet me, I guess, or just ask me on Discord if you're, if you, if you, if you know me there. I'm not on Twitter, but feel free to tweet Ash and I will, <laughs> I will hear about it. I'll pass the message along. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope everyone has a great day. Let us know what other decks you guys would like to see deep dives on and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Aren't you going to say bye? Bye. <laughs> bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the 10 Points Podcast. And don't forget to count your points.